as I mentioned, one of the core reasons the Men and Boys Coalition was founded was in response to the shared lack of profile and policy focus experienced by those working on issues of male gender disadvantage. Um, they tend to be something of an, uh, an orphan issue uh, amongst uh, policymakers, unfortunately. Um, so, and a key component of this is there tends to be something of a blind spot among funders for work that is specifically dedicated to supporting the well-being of men and boys, and uh, which obviously impacts on uh, the profile and and the, the, the voices that they those organisations can, can have. Um, two brilliant and notable exceptions are the Tudor Trust, to whom we are eternally grateful for their amazing support of the Men and Boys Coalition, which has allowed us to do all the work we can do, and the National Lottery Community Fund, uh, both, of, both of which fund a number of uh, coalition members. So today we are absolutely delighted to welcome Stephen Gould, West Yorkshire Funding Officer with the National Lottery Community Fund. Uh, Stephen works closely with uh, TNL Community Fund supported coalition members Men's Health Unlocked and Leads, and uh, Men's Health Unlocked do sector leading work connecting men in the city with services and raising the profile of men's wellbeing issues with the region's local authorities and third sector partners. Um, very much looking forward to Stephen's expert advice, insights and answers to everyone's questions on best practice for applying to funders if your work focuses on supporting men and boys. But first, to kick us off, is Men and Boys Coalition co-founder and chair Ali Fogg, if he is there, um, who will uh, give a snapshot of the coalition's work to date on making the case to the UK's funders about the need for dedicated support for men and, men and boys organisations. Uh, the coalition has been doing um, a fair amount of that, uh, working with funders and funding body representatives behind the scenes. Um, Ali, so perhaps we can hand over to you if you are there. Thank you. I am here. I'm going to apologise. My uh, webcam decided to uh, die on me about five minutes ago. Uh, I keep switching myself on and it's refusing to play. I think that means that I need to clear my cache and free up some memory and that kind of thing, which I won't bother doing now because I'll only be talking for a minute or two. Um, so you can look at a, a blank screen where my uh, my haggard old face would normally be. Um, but first of all, thanks, Dan. Uh, and literally, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to uh, bring us up to speed to where we are as a coalition on this. Um, the issue of uh, funding for the men's sector from uh, particularly the, the large national uh, funding bodies and philanthropic bodies has been one that's been on our radar for a long time. Um, it was brought into sharp focus again uh, two years ago almost exactly when an organisation called the DEI Coalition, which stands for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, uh, and which represents um, uh, a lot of the major funders, including the National Lottery Community Fund, Children in Need, Comet Relief, Joseph Rentry, Boss uh, uh, Trust, a lot of the organisations that, that we are talking about here. Um, they're all signed up to, to this uh, body, which advises on how to use philanthropic funding to uh, challenge social inequalities and structural injustice in society, which is an entirely uh, laudable objective. Um, and they produced a piece of work a couple of years ago uh, for consultation purposes, asked us to feedback on whether um, funders should sign up to a, a statement of intent, which basically said funders should prioritise, in the interests of diversity, equity and inclusion, should prioritise uh, projects supporting women, LGBT people, disabled people, BAME people, um, possibly one or two others, but they were the big ones. Um, and if uh, funders prioritise these organisations, then they will uh, better meet their objectives. Now, of course, what that means in practice is if you prioritise everyone except men, in which in, in, term, in, in practice is what we're talking about here, what you're actually doing is deprioritizing funding to the men's sector. So, you know, we, we took this quite hard and we got in touch with them and, and opened a fairly forceful uh, exchange of opinions and, uh, and communication. And I'd just like to read a couple of extracts from the letters that, uh, that went both ways. And um, we, in our first approach to them, we pointed out um, that uh, men as a category are significantly disadvantaged in society um, 
and that that actually is a factor in, amongst other things, gender uh, inequality, because where you have, for example, projects that are working with young men to, to, to build better, healthier relationships, um, that is obviously uh, got a direct and immediate consequence for uh, women's inequality. Um, and yet, men and projects doing this kind of work were being excluded from the, the, uh, the framework that was being proposed. Uh, so in discussing this, we got one reply back that I will read out to you now. Um, the group have discussed your concerns and we agreed that men and boys, in quotation marks, would be a good example uh, for the guidance of the use of lived experience field rather than a population group. So men and boys are not a population group, but are an example of lived experience. It goes on to say, we recognise that it is important to record this information for grants focused on these issues, but the issues facing men and boys are not frequently because they are men. Now we replied to them and asked asked them to explain this. And uh, we said, we, we would be happy to furnish you with extensive references in both academia and frontline practice to demonstrate that the following issues and many others occur to men wholly or largely because they are men. Examples, inequalities in health and life expectancy, disproportionate suicide rates, gender specific experiences of and recovery from inter intimate sexual and domestic abuse, rough sleeping homelessness, fatherhood and or fatherlessness, processes of criminalization, imprisonment and resistance, educational underachievement and educational exclusions. This is a far from exhaustive list. We, we, would have a, we would appreciate it if you could explain just how many such issues we would need to list before you would consider them to be frequent. Now, we never did get an answer to that question. We got an acknowledgement of our letter, but there was no attempt to answer it. Um, and basically, the DEI coalition closed us off. They, they shut down this conversation without really getting to any uh, satisfactory resolution. Uh, that was when we, as a, a board of trustees, realised that we needed to step back a bit and begin to open a dialogue at a quite high level with funders, um, whether directly or in their, their uh, coalitions like the DEI coalition and ask, look, what do we need to do in order to get you to understand the type of issues that we're dealing with and the importance of them? Um, so I think what we'd like to get out of this conversation today is not just a bit of advice as to how men's groups can apply for funding, but uh, some discussion of the wider issues of how we conceptualise men's issues and the men's sector within the charitable and philanthropic fields. Uh, so I hope I've, I've uh, put a bit of context to the type of issues that we're hoping to, to um, raise up to the surface today. Um, and yeah, I, I stress, you know, we're not just here to say, you know, how do you fill in a form to the national lotteries? And, and uh, uh, on that, I will pass over to people who really do know what they're talking about. So thank you for that time. That was fantastic, Ali. I, um, yeah, you absolutely do know what you're talking about. And that was really, really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, Stephen. Yeah, great. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, it would be really good to come back, definitely to come back to that conversation. Um, I, I, apologies in advance. I, I, I am going to do a little bit of um, kind of awareness raising perhaps around that National Lottery Community Fund. I'll be fairly quick. Most of what I'm going to say you will find on our website, obviously. Um, but I just thought it might be useful um, for people to, at least everyone will be up to a certain level of knowledge about what we do. And then... Um, at the end, I want I want to bring Damien in, if if that's okay, just just to say a very few brief words about the project that he's um, leading in Leeds, um, because it is it is a concrete example of a of a fairly large grant that we've made recently around specifically around men's health. So, um, but I, d I definitely it would be great to return to the the wider issues that Ali Ali's raised uh, there. Um, if I is that okay if I if I just oh, um, absolutely we'll yeah I mean entirely led by you um, okay you're the expert in the room so <laughs> no yeah, wonderful thank you okay yeah. and I've got I've got a few slides which I'm gonna share with you and um, but I won't uh, labour them I will uh, um, zip through as uh, as quickly as I can but obviously very happy to um, take any questions or comments um, uh, uh, follow, following the pre presentation. Um, as, as Dan said, I, I, I'm a funding officer and I, I work in the Yorkshire and Humber region uh, um, for the National Lottery Community Fund. Um, I, I, I would 
preface further comments by saying I, I am kind of at the coal face in terms of the organization. I, I'm, 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 I'm in terms of the hierarchy, I'm fairly near, near the bottom of the hierarchy. So I'm not involved in kind of higher level discussions um, that, that, that uh, we might want to return to later. But, um, but it is the things, the, the issues that have been raised already are things that we would be concerned about within our team, simply in Yorkshire and Humber, let, let alone further afield. Um, so that's the uh, agenda for the presentation. Uh, there are eight things on there, but I am going to zip through them fairly um, quickly. Um, I guess just to start by saying that um, uh, the background to this really is that in 2020, we um, switched our focus for eight or nine months around emergency funding in, re in response to the pandemic. And we stopped making awards from uh, lottery funds uh, for, for that period. We were distributing uh, government money from DCMS um, for quite a while. And so we reopened the programs that I'm gonna mention briefly uh, in December, 2020, um, but they were broadly similar to what we were funding be before, before the pandemic. Um, so the National Lottery Community Fund is, is one of a number of distributors of funds that are raised by uh, uh, from people playing the National Lottery. Um, we are a, a non-public, non uh, a non-departmental public body. At, so we work at arm's length from government, but we are attached to the Department for Digital um, Culture, Media and Sport um, and accountable to Parliament. Um, just so people are clear, uh, around about 28% of um, the money that you might spend on a lotto ticket goes goes to rate rate raising uh, goes to good causes um so that's about on a two pound ticket that's 56 pence um uh, and that is shared between as i say a number of, of lottery distributors but we are in the fortunate position of having the largest share about 40 percent of the money that's raised from the national lottery um and that's across the uk so we are we are a uk organization but i'm conscious that the coalition also is and 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 i work specifically in england think that broadly speaking things that i'm going to say apply across the uk but there are different programs in the, in the, in each country um but the broad principles are are, are similar but i'm going to the, the programs i talk about are specifically for england so j again just with that um with with that caveat um those are our, our broad purposes our kind of main strap line, I guess, is, is, is supporting people and communities to thrive. Um, we want to support ideas that are important to people and communities. We want to um, help create stronger and more connected communities. And we want to support the civil society sector generally to be vibrant, diverse and active. Um, as I say, our website is fairly comprehensive in terms of our funding office offer. So it, it is a good a good place to um, visit. I'm gonna talk about these two programs very quickly because they're the ones I'm most familiar with. And um, the National Lottery Awards for All program does work across the UK. Um, Richie Communities and Partnerships are, are England programs specifically, but there are similar programs in the other countries. Um, we encourage people to apply through our website. Uh, but there are, if, if that's not possible, we, there are other um, avenues to submit applications. Um, who can apply is fairly wide, as long as it's essentially not, it's an organization, it's a kind of not-for-profit organization, we're fairly flexible around the kind of organizations that can apply to us. So Awards for All, um, probably most people have, have, have heard of it, it's been running for in one form or another for more than 20 years. Um, currently we offer grants between 300 and 10,000 pounds over one year. Groups can only hold one of these grants at any one time and they're made nominally for 12 months. So the project doesn't have to necessarily last for 12 months. Um, it's a fairly quick turnaround on decisions. We say typically 12 weeks, but depending on how many applications come in at any particular time, because it's an open rolling program, sometimes lots of applications come in at the same time so that might slow the process down but it so sometimes it's a lot less than 12 weeks um but 12 weeks would be the the, the target date something to bear in mind if you apply to awards for all is is that the amount of time that it's going to take for you to get a decision this is our most popular pro grants program it's where the most of the grants that we make as an organization are these um smaller grants up to up to ten thousand pounds and these are processed um, centrally by colleagues in, in Birmingham and Newcastle in England. The reaching communities and partnerships are two 
programs that provide funding above ten thousand pounds um, and for longer periods multi-year funding up to five years it's also a rolling program people can apply anytime they want and these um grant applications are processed by teams in in england in in regional hubs so um in the in my case in in yorkshire and humber uh we can fund a fairly wide range of things through this the normally the big costs that we fund would be around things like staffing costs um training um, we can fund some organizational development costs we can also fund capital projects through this program as well so it's again it's fairly um, flexible in terms of uh, the type of things that we can fund and this is the program the partnerships program is the program that we funded the men's health unlocked program in leeds through um we're still we've still we're still looking to support people and communities particularly affected by the pandemic and that, that that's still when we stopped uh, distributing the government money with that wasn't something that we stopped as a focus so we are still very conscious that looking at grant applications that have come in are very much uh, many are around the kind of process of re-emerging from the pandemic and reconnecting people so that's still quite a strong pr priority for us I've got a few myth, myth busters here, which I'm just going to quickly whiz through. Um, to increase your chances of being um, funded by us, you need to employ an experienced bid writer. That's not necessarily the case, not the case. Um, I think what many people find when they generate, when they, when they're working on applications, it's useful to have a critical friend, perhaps someone that can look at the, look at uh, a, a draft bid and give you some honest feedback on it. Um, but it's certainly not a requirement that you actually pay somebody to write bids for you. And that's not something that we would necessarily encourage. Um, it also, another myth is that you need to use the right language and the right buzzwords. Um, uh, and like most organizations, we can sometimes be guilty of using kind of buzzwords and, 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 and repeat certain uh, terms over and over again. It's not essential. What I think is useful is not to simply regurgitate information that is on our website and just use the same language. Um, it sometimes uh, we have applications where people just kind of say, well, we meet this priority, but they don't explain why they meet that priority. So it's important that um, you try to explain what it is that you're applying for funding in, in, your, in your own words, but it's not necessary to include any particular terminology. Um, as I just said, I mean, we're, we're not only, we were only funding projects that were COVID related, but we're certainly not now, but we would expect applications that come in to take account of the impact of the pandemic and, and to take on board any learning that groups um, acquired through whatever work they were undertaking during the pandemic. Uh, majority of funding officers are career civil servants with a background in accountancy. That is certainly not true. And, and um, at most of, Myself and most of my colleagues in the Auction Humber team have worked in the third sector for many years. I've, um, I, I managed a, a third sector organisation for several years. We understand the kind of uh, pressures um, and priorities that affect charities and, and, and other voluntary sector organisations. Um, so uh, there, is, there is a lot of lived experience there amongst funding officers at the fund. Um, and another myth is that we're not allowed to fund religious groups. We, we do fund uh, churches and, and other and other re religious groups. Um, what we can't do is is provide funding for religious activities or worship, but we can certainly provide funding where there's a focus of uh, religious organisations on on community work. Some key key kind of elements within our approach: uh, we we are a funder for everybody. Um, we are, I think. A fairly flexible funder. We, I think we demonstrated that during the pandemic with existing grant holders who had to change their plans quite dramatically because of that. We try to be proportionate. We don't necessarily ask for the same level of detail for an application for £20,000 as we would for an application for £400,000. And we try to um, operate through a kind of conversational relational approach. So when people apply to us, it's not a kind of form that you just put all the information in there and we say yes or no. It will be the start of a conversation between us and groups that apply for funding. Three of our key principles, which are really important if you do apply for funding from us, is that we want to fund projects that have involved 
people that are going to benefit from the project, not just in the planning of it, the development of the idea, but also that they will continue to be involved and shape the delivery of the project through its, through its lifetime. We want to focus on a strength-based approach, so looking at what strengths there already are in whatever community that is. It doesn't have to be a geographic community, it can be a community of interest, and how projects will build on those strengths. Um, and, and finally, we need um, we want to fund uh, groups that are connected, that are uh, aware of what else is going on in the area that they're working, geographical community of interest, um, ensuring that they're uh, working with other organizations collaboratively, not overlapping, and that they're sharing their learning from the work that they do with, with, with other groups, for example. We've got three specific priorities for funding in England. Um, so uh, the first one is around bringing people together, strengthening relationships in and across communities, and again, communities of interest as well as geographic communities so for example we fund we funded a lot of stuff around tackling loneliness social isolation but um any kind of project that enables people to come together around a particular interest um enables people to connect better with those their communities and they though they might be communities who are have traditionally been disconnected from the communities they live in so for example people with learning disabilities or uh, refugees and asylum seekers um, shared and sustainable places and spaces. Again, these could be physical spaces, a community centre, a park, that kind of thing, but they can also be virtual spaces. Um, the, the key thing for us always would be if we want to do some improvements anywhere, what, what's the impact of that? What, what difference is going to make to people's lives? And the final priority around early action um again this is the, any, any any kind of work really which um a lot, a lot of work we fund in this area may be around health uh, mental health particularly um barriers uh, to employment that um th those kind of themes for reaching communities and partnerships the application process is a, a works through uh, various stages um so initial funding proposal which is a, fair, a relatively brief um, initial application. We, we review those and th those that we think we may be able to find, we invite to submit additional information. If we want, if we need to turn a project down, project application down at the first stage, we'll give some feedback about why that is. If groups are invited through, they work on a much more detailed funding proposal, which ultimately goes to a panel for a final decision. Um, the initial form, these are the questions broadly that we ask. Um, important ones, particularly how you'll involve your community, how it fits with other, with other activities. Um, it doesn't have to be local activities. I mean, it, the activities in a sector you're working in, for, for example. As I say, if, it, if, if applications pro progress through to the next stage of assessment, the, again, these are some of the things that we'll talk to you about, more detail about the proposal and uh, more detail on the project budget, for example. One of the things that runs through the whole application is a uh, process is safeguarding, and that's a kind of key um, underlying <coughs> element. So that's something that we talk to applicant groups about as, as they work through the application process, but it's something that's um, very high on our agenda. So any projects working with children or young people or vulnerable adults, we, we would... Um, uh, have conversations with applicants specifically around their safeguarding arrangements. Getting towards the end now, just to finish, um, a few, these are just a few reasons that we, common reasons really, that we say no to funding applications. I, the main one I would say is the first one, the idea doesn't fit strongly enough with the funding priorities that I've outlined. Um, another reason is that the project proposal as it stands doesn't really address the challenge that the applicant groups identified so they've identified a particular challenge or an issue that they want to address through a project but it's not clear in the application that the precise activities that they're proposing would actually address that challenge um, the proposal doesn't adequately address equity diversity inclusion and that is again very very important so um, any application that we would review we would we would talk to groups about making sure that their project is as inclusive as possible and how they would ensure that it would be open to all. Um, where there's significant duplication um, with other work that's already happening. And then the final point, which is 
something that certainly doesn't just apply to the National Lottery Community Fund, but to, to all funders is, is just to remind people that it's very unlikely that most organisations that you apply to funding for are going to have enough funds to support all of the projects that they would like to ideally. Um, it is very competitive applying for our funds and we do uh, sometimes have to say no to some good proposals. And then finally, a few top tips. Um, consult as widely as possible absolutely is, is absolutely uh, critical and 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 to uh, and as i said earlier to in, involve as many of the people that might benefit from the project in that consultation is, is really important to uh, understand uh, whether or not your budget's realistic uh, again this is something that we can talk to you about and also um, be aware of that we will also look at the financial position of your organization as part of a larger application as well so understanding whether giving providing funding for, for an organization at a particular time is is the right thing to do for that organization at that point any any proposal needs to have some clear aims objectives and and very importantly measurable outcomes that that's probably the single most important thing for example that our decision making panels would look at would be around what difference is this project going to make because they may be in a position where they need to make decisions between funding different um applications that are before them and the, the key uh, the key uh, question will, will be what difference will it make if we invest in this project As I've already said, there's lots of good information on our website, and not just about the application process, but also about how to uh, collect evidence, how to uh, to support your bid, how to collect evidence of the impact of your project once it's running. Um, there's lots of information about uh, other projects that we've already funded that might be working in a similar area to the one you are. So there's lots of good learning there on our website as well. In the there's a section called insights, which you can you, you can access uh, reports and documents relating to all of the wide range of thematic areas that we that we fund. Pick up the phone or email a funding officer. Our website has got contact details for for each of the regional hubs in England, for example, and there'll they'll be contact details for the home countries as well. Um, and have a have an honest conversation with the funding officer. I think one of the things that we're really keen to be is is to talk as honestly as we can with with applicants about about their bids, um, about the strengths and weaknesses of them. And uh, it works really well if we can if we can have that kind of on, on, honest uh, those honest conversations. And don't forget those those priorities that i mentioned earlier people in the lead connected and strength based they're really important um i'm going to stop there because i've i've spoken for 18 minutes um i, I just wanted to bring damien in now if, if possible just just to say a few words about the men's health unlocked uh, project in leeds which we funded initially uh through uh the covid emergency funding that i mentioned earlier so we gave a grant, uh, a short term, six month ish grant uh, to um, uh, for, for the project. But the, all, all of those COVID related uh, funding funded projects finished in March 2021. So it was it was a fairly short term but it, grant. But I think it enabled um, the Men's Health Unlocked project to kind of collect more evidence about the impact that it that it had in that short period a very critical time for so many so many men um, and um, they uh, then worked up a more uh, detailed uh, proposal for funding over a longer period which um, we were able to support in November last year funded um, the program for two years uh, for about uh, 340,000 pounds and um, it's a partnership project, so it involves um, a number of different organisations in Leeds, and there are quite a few different interesting strands to it, which are tackling different aspects of um, a gendered approach to uh, uh, tackling uh, men men's health issues. Um, would you like to say a few words at this point, um, Damien, if that's okay? Yeah, thank sure, so, Stephen. Thank, sure, thank yeah. you so, thank you so much, Stephen. That was really, fan really fascinating. I just want to quickly jump in. Has somebody got their mic? I can hear chattering in the background. Um, I think, oh, I think that's what it is. I think Stephen is using, is it, can we use an internal mic and everyone is muted? Okay, sorry. Sorry, just to do a practical, <laughs> practical point in there. 
Stephen, that was really fascinating and um, really clear and transparent and practical and supportive uh, approach, um, it looks to me from, from what you said. Um, sorry, Damien, to jump in and cut you off. Please go ahead. That's all right. Um, can we bring that slide back just for a second? Is that all right? Thanks, David. Yeah, so, um, so uh, yeah, men's health are not. Um, as, so Stephen's given a, a good introduction to it there. Um, just, just a quick overview of what it is. As, as Stephen said, we've got lots of different strands, as we call them, going on. Uh, and for men's health are not, I know we're not here to talk about men's health are not, but just to give you a flavour of what we do, um, we've got different strands that are kind of about supporting the sort of in general, supporting the greater good of mental health and well-being in Leeds and surround. So um, things like a men's magazine or an activities phone line um, or advocates advocating for mental health and well-being. They're all about, they are individual men recruited to, to support all of those projects, but it's about supporting the wider health and well-being needs of, of, of men in Leeds. So we're working very much with men um, to help support other men around them. We're also giving away Wi-Fi enabled tablets to individual men as well to access them into services. We've got an ambassador project. We have shopkeepers giving out the men's magazine and having conversations with their regular customers to help sort of, to help connect with these men that we don't see coming to the community centers. Yeah, you know, they're very isolated. They're just going in to get their, to get their fags or their milk or whatever it is, um, uh, you know, whatever it is they're getting. So um, yeah. Fish and chips, often chippies, we found were a good, a good, a good place to to to, to get people. Um, and by the way, this is a little advert for mental health. We're not having a Northern Man Festival next June for Mental Health Week. So, if there's anyone who's interested in get taking part in that, we are welcoming local, regional, and national organisations to come to that. So, please do come along. Um, it's going to be um, it's going to be a really interesting, really interesting event. Um, it's loosely based on being a man festival itself. Bank, if you managed to go to that culture information discussion entertainment things like that um yeah so uh Stephen, i suppose i could say a little bit about um adding sort of more sort of men's applying for men's funding sort of angle to that and sort of i suppose what i've learned from the process with yourselves and just generally in my sort of wider work anyway um i suppose and um, what I'd, I would echo, first of all, I'd, I would echo Stephen's comments about the lottery being flexible and, and, and converse, conversational. I mean, you know, I, I know Stephen has given me a lot of money, um, literally, to be here now, actually. I mean, the, the lottery are paying for my time here. But um, that's <laughs> not why I'm saying it. Uh, so they, they are, gen, they are of, you know, I've worked with a lot of different funders and, and they, are, they are great like that. Um, you can work with them. It's not like a, a, a straight binary Oh no, that's not really good enough. The end. You know, it's it's you 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 work with them sort of to, to to you can raise the problems with them. You know, oh you know, you know, oh, I'm going to have difficulties. You know, what, what 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 if the partners don't talk to each other? You know, the sort of classic collaboration issues that that do exist because people different organisations have their own priorities, uh, and and you know, it's okay to admit that because it's just the real world. You know. Um, uh, and and th they'll help you sort of na navigate that you know that they might suggest for example an independent person to come in and and help um evaluate the, the strength of your collaboration and you can use those lessons to then apply to make improvements for example so so yeah um so definitely be like that and um Yes, and I echo Tudor Trust, also a great funder, because I've actually been funded by Tudor Trust as well. Re really, really flexible. Um, I think in general, when, when, when applying for men's, for men's uh, funding, um, and mentioned at the start of the meeting, the sort of, uh, you know, are, are men worthy kind of thing, you know, it's, it, what's hot and what's not kind of thing. And, and it's, it's, in my general work, in general, as I'm sure you guys uh, people do as well is that you, you know it's often very useful to, to use, go to stats statistics you know i know there are lies about statistics but but actually a lot of statistics are, are, are very have got a lot of um uh 
uh, I suppose, what's the word, uh, gravitas to them or something like that impact to, you know, that they're, they're meaningful. Um, and when I write, when I wrote my bid to the lottery, of course, I, I, I used stats a lot and um, to, to, to make the point. And, and you can get those statistics from all over the place. In Leeds, we're lucky. We've got Leeds Observatory. It's a superb resource of different um, statistics uh, from around Leeds. It's this team of like boffins create um, on a, on a, on a uh, full-time employed boffins creating all these different reports and statistics on wards in Leeds and different things. Um, we've also got the state of men's health in Leeds and the Leeds suicide audit. Now, I, I mentioned them today because I think that might be something that you might find useful. I know it's got, I know it's Leeds based, but the uh, state of men's health in Leeds report um, was uh, the, the main author was um, Professor Alan White, who's the uh, patron of the Men's Health Forum. Um, and th that report was kind of the first of its kind in the country. Now, I don't know if you can extrapolate some of the things they found from that report and say one would suggest that the, the things we're finding for men in Leeds might be the same in Manchester or Bristol or Edinburgh or wherever it is you is. You know, you might be able to use that report. Um, and the Leeds Suicide Audit is the foremost suicide analysis in the country and no no other place uh, burrows down quite as far as the lead suicide audit team do in order to find the causes of suicide again how much a fund will allow you to extrapolate lessons from leads to a wider to a different area but um we did find that the suicide, suicide rate in leads is higher than the national average on the back of that analysis which suggests that it might be it might be higher nationwide as well. Um, you, you know, there's it's five times as many men to women in Leeds will, will take their own lives. Um, so, and and there's things like, um, it, it establishes that things like separation is a key cause, um, uh, um, uh, money worries, a redundancy is a key cause of suicide as well. And there's, you know, there, there, there are a number of factors that they list as being real trigger points, real danger points for suicide. So again, you could, I know there's other suicide research and I know you guys probably know a lot of this already, but yeah, there are things, please, you know, go and use it if you think it'll be useful. It, they're, they're both on the Men's Health Unlocked website. So um, um, I can put the link in on there or, or Dan, if you can, but if you know, it, if you can put the link in for us, that, that'll be useful. Um, so yeah, stats really good. Um, collaboration as Stephen said is good that's just a general funding thing really isn't it make sure you, you know you do things in, in partnership with other people make the use make best use of other people's resources the thing about the sort of i suppose the pervade you know the idea that in my work if i mention men's self i still do sometimes now i feel obliged to mention women are important too and i think sometimes you talk about women's health you don't feel obliged to mention that men are important too i'm not saying that people don't think that but there's that culture of you need to show that sort of heightened awareness, I suppose, sometimes you feel you do, of, of, of that agenda that, that, that is out there. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to be going on, you don't want to, and you don't look like you're doing what about them, or well, women get this, well, why don't we get that? You really need to avoid that. Of course you do. Um, and I think um, we, one of the ways we avoided that, but also said something we genuinely believed in, was to say how what's good for men is, is good for women. And that was something that featured in, in our bid, you know, because, you know, happy husbands, happy sons means happy mothers, happy wives, for example. Do you see, do you see what I mean? So it's, it's just about making society a better place. So that's, that's possibly a good tip if you're worried about that kind of, um, you know, that, that agenda being applied to you by a fund who may, may not be as open minded as the Tudor Trust or the Lottery are. Uh, it's certainly in my experience. Um, and, um, so yeah, I'd recommend doing that. So you, you know, you, you, and but at the same time, don't apologise for what you're applying for either. Yeah, your stats are backing you up, you know. But it's not a bad thing to reassure the funder that you're not just some sort of, I don't know, what we're supposed to be, Spider-Man climbing Buckingham Palace or whatever it was that he did, you know. So whatever that, you know, that sort of poor, poor image, you know, don't don't live, you know, don't don't you know try and avoid being you know so you don't get associated with whatever that that thing is um uh yeah so that would be my my sort of angle on it i mean i suppose generally uh i agree that it, it, the lottery does that thing about jargon 
uh, and saying co-production and all those kind of terms like that. I mean, another thing to avoid, another good reason to avoid using terms like that, which I do in, 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 in my general work anyway, if I can, is that it shows that you know what you're talking about by not using those terms. It shows you think about things, you can explain it in another way, because sometimes, you know, one can use those terms as a, just a, you can hide behind them a little bit, can't you? So um, I think as long as there isn't too much of a word count, then you can you might want to explain yourself in a few more words, and then I'd recommend it because it shows it shows you think about things. Um, um, and yeah, and do be honest because uh, you know, and you, you, because uh, it will come out in the wash otherwise anyway if you don't. Um, and yeah, and your integrity will show through. Um, so yeah, but if anyone wants to talk to me about the process that we've been through and the bid that we wrote, I'm I'm happy to to talk to people about that if that's what they'd like to do. Thank you, Damien. That was actually a perfect um, kind of, com uh, if you like, companion piece to to Stephen's. Uh, it's like both sides of the coin, both sides of the story, um, drawing out the issues from both perspectives, which is much better than the. the the sort of probably ham-fisted questions I would have asked. <laughs> so that's really great um, and really good insights. I mean, um, I, I mean, I, I won't jump in with a question myself. But, um, do, uh, others, uh, is anybody else, have they got any questions they'd like to put forward? And if, if not, I might also just, if, if Ali wants to jump in again, because I'm to sort of talk about maybe some of the broader structural issues. Um, I can't see anybody posting anything at the moment. Um, I suppose one of the things that I think is quite interesting from what was what was being said there by you both was essentially kind of looking at the facts really and looking at um, you know what what are the circumstances of of the group that you're supporting and 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 sort of taking it from there and and not applying you know any other lens to it than that, which I think is um, seems to be yeah seems to be sort of works in favour of a group working for men and boys issues at, at any rate. So um, we've got one from Damien. Which, uh, for interest in the Northern Man Festival, oh, please contact Glyn Space 2. Yeah, I'm just replying to it. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, Ali, did uh, Ali did, did you want to open up the conversation again to some of the, the broader, broader points you mentioned at the beginning? Yeah, happily to. Um, maybe before I do, or, or uh, perhaps by way of doing so, uh, I'll add one thing maybe to uh, what's already been said about just advice for applications. Um, I, I should say, um, not with a, a men and boys hat on, but in, a, in previous working life, uh, I've also uh, applied for, uh, been awarded and ran a National Lottery Reaching Communities Fund project for three years. So uh, I, I can uh, happily reiterate what, uh, what Damien said about uh, National Lottery being really good funders and, and they're very helpful and if you possibly can get an application into them, uh, I'd, I'd, I really can't, uh, can't be adequately thankful for what they, they have done over the years. Um, but to add my point, uh, there's a word that hasn't come up yet which really works well, particularly when we're talking about the DEI frameworks, and that's intersectionality. Um, it's come out of academia, uh, it's a word that scares a lot of people, but uh, the funders will generally know what you're talking about when, when you use that word. And basically what it means is that your different um, lived experiences, as uh, the DEI call it, your, your uh, status uh, by gender, uh, gender identity, sexuality, race, ethnicity, religion, all the rest of it, um, will create unique circumstances for and, and needs for people. Uh, so, for example, um, the experience of being a disabled black woman is not just the experience of being a disabled person and a black person and a, a woman. Uh, it, it's a unique um, fusion of, of your identities. Uh, and this is really well and widely understood when we're talking about women and when we're talking about LGBT groups and talking about disability and so on. Um, what fewer people understand is just how powerful this is when we're talking about men. And from that, the, the exchange we had with the DEI a couple of years ago, I'm going to bring up the, the original and quote to you directly. Um, there's a, there was a slide on the DEI's consultation page 
which uh, was there to explain uh, how intersectionality worked. And one of the things it showed was uh, quality of life outcomes for people with uh, different um, identity uh, categorizations, uh, particularly on disability. So it found that if you were a BAME uh, disabled woman, uh, you had, oh, sorry, it, it, if you were a disabled woman, uh, you had worse outcomes than a uh, uh, non-disabled uh, woman. If you are a uh, uh, non, uh, uh, I'm confusing myself here. I'm looking on over the uh, page and trying to get it. Um, here we are. Uh, the the graph showed that while non-disabled white men earn more than non-disabled white women, and both earn more than non-disabled BAME peers. When we include disability in the analysis, an entirely different picture emerges in which disabled white men earn less than any other group, which is not what we would expect where multiple disadvantages reduced to the sum of their parts. And so it's not just the case that if you're a man, you do worse than a woman or a woman, you do worse than a man, but your different statuses interact with each other to complete, to create completely unique pictures. Now, from your point of view, as somebody who might be applying for a grant, that's really worth knowing because you should look into all of that because it might well be relevant to the work that you do. If you're working with disabled black men, uh, you shouldn't assume that what applies to all disabled people will apply to your group, that, uh, that all men will apply to your group. It can be unique and that can be really important. Um, but I think it also, uh, from our point of view, as a coalition who's trying to support the sector, and um, this is why it's so important that men are included as a, a legitimate population group in their own right. Because unless you're considering the, the statistics and the conditions and the lived experiences of men as men, then you cannot get an accurate uh, position, uh, uh, accurate understanding of the population group that you're dealing with. Yeah. So that is both uh, uh, another point that I will throw into the discussion at the top level, but also maybe a, a bit of advice if you are considering a, an application to the uh, National Lottery or to anyone else. Um, I appreciate I jabbered a bit there, so I wasn't expecting Dan to come. <laughs> Sorry, Ali. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Um, so I was kind of winging it there. Uh, and apologies if that was a bit flustered, but I think got the point across. So I'd be interested to know what other people's experiences are or what their thoughts are. Anybody like to come in at this point? Everybody's been very, very quiet. Um, it, it, Ali, just checking, are you saying that by using an intersectional analysis, if that's the right term, um, it's because of that intersectional analysis that we were able to see that disabled white men earn less than any other group? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, hmm. I'll read you through the, the intro to the bit that I just read for more clarity. Um, the, the graph I was looking at, uh, which came from the DAI's own page, uh, so I was, I was showing them what they were telling us back to them. Um, it was saying horizontal inequality, inequalities are multiple and complex. Uh, so intersectionality is about recognising that people can face multiple disadvantages, such as being both BAME and female, uh, but the disadvantages cannot be reduced to the sum of their parts. So. If you were to just know the figures for disabled people earning less than non-disabled people and women earning less than men and BAME people earning less than white people, you would assume that uh, a, a, a white disabled man is going to earn more than a black disabled man or a white disabled woman. Or, you know, uh, uh, in fact, the, the exact opposite happens. Um, and probably what it is, there's something about gender, there's something about men um, where when you, when you crash, you crash harder. You know, like, it, 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 I don't particularly like the kind of um, uh, bell curve argument about men's welfare and disadvantages. It's not that simple. Um, but the bottom line is, if you are a, a man with a, a criminal record and uh, you're homeless and you've got addiction issues, um, there's less support there for you, and society is generally um, inclined towards kicking you harder than you know, any of those elements in, in their own right. Uh, and there's something about men. And I suspect 
a lot of it comes down to what I would call patriarchy. <laughs> Apologies to anyone who finds that that uh, concept uh, offensive or difficult. Um, that that our society expects men to be able to stand on their own two feet and be stoic and, and look after yourself and, and be tough and be able to cope. Um, and that's a, a very uh, old fashioned patriarchal value, uh, which as a, a culture, we haven't really found a way to wrestle with and, and we, we haven't found a way to, to really conceptualize that and address it um, in ways that, that kind of make sense and work for people. Does that, does that kind of get what you were asking there? Yeah, thanks, Ali. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, when you compared it, sort of the, the black disabled woman type thing that that helped explain it. Yes, yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. Can I um, would you mind if I added on to that um, the and drawing also to what I believe Damien brought up, which was um, uh, putting somewhere in your application that uh, you're 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 not. Uh, a maniac group basically that you're not going to be uh, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, expressing yourself in ways that are inappropriate and I think this comes down to an observation I've put in some papers that um, if, if a man is distressed he is something to be scared of if a man runs into a room screaming in distress your first instinct will be to protect the children around them Whereas if a woman runs into a room screaming with, with distress, your, your natural reaction is to find out what happened and, and to protect her. And there's this fundamental natural difference in the way that we see men's problems, I think, that the first thing that you need to make people comfortable with is that you're not actually a threat. Yes, that's, uh, yeah, no, I, yeah, these things... Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I think the kind of mm. the, the, the issues we're talking about are expressions of really deep unconscious forces, without a doubt. Terence, where do you mind if I mean, you don't have to say, but out of interest, are you for, are you calling in for an organisation or are you speaking for yourself? Either I mean, you don't have to say. I, 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 I volunteer with um, Gender Parity UK and uh, with uh, Parity as well. So are you going to put your hand? Uh, hand up, Damien. Just that so there is, uh, um, just in relation to what Terence just said that about um, a man in stress in the room, I, I wonder if there is a certain degree of genuine reason for a bit of that fear and that men do express their stress physically um, a lot more. Like it's just, it's something that they do. Professor White will, will talk about this. It's the way they manifest, they, men will manifest their, straight, their stress in a physical way. So there is a little bit I'm just, I know I hear what you're saying, terms. I'm just putting a little flick of the other side of the, the coin a little yeah. bit to consider yeah. amongst that. I'm not saying it's wrong. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not a wrong instinct. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm saying cool, it's, cool. that is the instinct. Yeah. Owen, would you, I mean, I don't want to sort of put people on the spot here, but as, you know, uh, a central part of one of the, London's leading men and boys organisations. What is your experience of this whole conversation, getting funders and working with funders and getting support and and everything? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know I, I kind of reflect and echo and, and hear everything that's been said and, and, and I've got experience of both ends of it, the challenges of getting people to recognise the needs of your service user group, um, depending on the mission and aims of your organisation. And, and then once that kind of, um, once you've been able to be successful in getting that recognized, then being able to actually get meaningful multi-year funding to allow it to continue. There is something of a side, even it's a related, but it's a related, but not the whole issue we're talking about here is that, you know, increasingly the safety nets around everyone in society, including boys and men are falling away, right? And so a lot of the structural, statutory services that used to be available through health, through community organisations, through social care, early health, stuff for parents and families that we're just starting to make kind of leeway on including men within those provisions and doing better, including fathers or understanding mental health needs. You know, the, the pot we're all scrabbling around becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And the need in wider society with all these kind of overlapping crises we've been going through for the last few two or three years of, of 
pandemics and cost of living, the global war and, and, and a refocus and awareness around kind of inequalities in the world, Black Lives Matter, et cetera, has kind of left us with heightened need in society and less resource to do it. So those funders who are open and willing, like National Lottery Community Funding, we've had some successes with for our work with Boys and Young Men, um, like some Tudor Trust who's funded us in the past, you can find yourselves in patterns when they'll support you for as long as they can and sometimes even longer than they're supposed to. But then when that finishes, to continue that work, everyone starts to think about mainstreaming that. And what does mainstreaming mean? You know, it used to be the idea of how do you get this work recognised and accepted as part of a statutory offer or delivered by the local authority. And, and you know, that is just an unrealistic option nowadays, you know, unless you can do some really good work with academics, maybe in the health sector, prescribing so I, so I just think you know if we want to start tackling you know the societal norms that were mentioned there around you know men's historic acceptable behavior are are um you know the perceptions of men within society of not needing help or not wanting help or not asking for help and also the, the associated benefits that um, Damien was talking about that we've draw a lot on it you know highlighting that we're here you know one of the core goals of, of our mission is, is we support every boy, every man, everyone to make a better future for everyone sort of thing, you know, supporting boys and men isn't just for the boys and men, it's for everyone else that they go on to affect in their day-to-day -day lives, their partners, their children, their neighbours, their local communities. So in making those arguments, um, hopefully you can circumvent the initial kind of closed door that Ali was describing at the beginning that well and truly exists and I'm very, very, very familiar with that we don't necessarily fit within those immediately and then you're looking at the intersections between the boys and men we're working with and if they have any of those protected characteristics to try and allow us through that door if you work in an area which is predominantly a white british area or you're working with a target group of white british um uh, uh, uh target group as a cohort you don't have the opportunity to lean on any of those protected characteristics you know so there, therein lies the challenge. And the reality is, again, is there's something divisive about that in and of itself. You know, whilst it's really important to be able to put aside a, um, particular funds to work with those who are less represented and have less access to those funds, um, we still have to remember that part of the reason why we're doing that work is to try and bring us all better together as a society as a whole. It might take a generation to do that. So therefore, we have to set aside enough funds through charitable trusts and government money to allow us to do this protective work for a period of time. The end goal of not having to need so many protective characteristics because we are meaningfully included and represented within more broader and wider stream society. That's the challenge, I think, not necessarily for the funding bodies that are giving, but for umbrella rules and us all collectively together to keep chipping away across many forums with funders, with policymakers, with the media, with the general public. And, and with our cohort of, of service users, men and boys themselves, so that we, they're actually standing up and putting their hand up and saying, yeah, yeah, this is what I think, these are my opinions, and this is what I want to change. Um, that's a bit of a diatribe, uh, a little bit. I was rambling a bit when you uh, asked me a question. <laughs> I think it's, it's such a challenging, it's such a challenging world to be in. And I find myself here as I'm talking to you, scrubbing around, applying, you know, working on funding bits. You know, it, it becomes the work of someone like us who runs a charity and find all your time is spent chasing money to keep things going. And so I'll be quiet now because I see hands going. Thank, thank you so much, Owen. That, no, that is no, that's a, a brilliant insight. And I know you've got such depth of experience, so it's always valuable to hear what you have to say. Um, uh, Damien's putting his hand up. Yeah. yeah just a quick one. I know we've got to wrap up now, haven't we? Um, but, well, yeah, I was going to um, say, thanks, everybody, for not yeah. rushing off. I'm happy to keep on chuntering on about men and boys' issues all day long. <laughs> but not, not everyone is. I understand that. So, I'm on, so I'm <laughs> on, well, I do have to go in a But I mean, I, I think that was a really interesting point when you yeah. say about, you know, sort of changing, doing our bit to sort of promote the, the health and well-being of, of, of men and boys and, and almost sort of cha challenging that culture. And, and I think in our funding bids as well, it'd be very easy to sort of go down the traditional line and not challenge it and play to the crowd a little bit. Say, so, yeah, you know, we're doing stuff about men, you know, addressing um, how that they're, 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 yeah, all, it's all about mental health. You know, it's all about them needing, needing to change. And I'm not discounting that as a thing to everyone working on their own mental health, their own mental attitudes, 
is a good thing and some need it more than others etc so i'm not counting that but i think it's you know um I, I, yeah i think it's it's a really good point you know I could try and keep your integrity in your bid and don't be afraid to say actually there are physical there are societal there are structural things that are an issue for men that we are hoping to support them with um and it's good to, it, 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 yeah yeah so it's a good on you if, if you're doing yeah for for, for 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 doing that because because otherwise the more you, the more you play to that crowd the, the, the longer that 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 legacy of that skewed that skewed uh sort of uh overview um pervades really can i just draw Stephen back since we're lucky enough to have him in the, in the room because you said you mentioned at the beginning that some of the points that ali raised were i don't know recognized i think i don't want to put words in your mouth there's some that you're kind of aware of them within your colleagues i mean is that right is, i'd be interested to hear more what you had to say about that if anything yeah well i was really interested in in what ali said at the beginning of the meeting and and i think certainly from a kind of um equity diversity and inclusion point of view um i would argue that we do take a much more nuanced approach than than simply We've got some categories or some population groups that we're, you know, our priorities um, and that others aren't. Um, and I think I think we would the intersectionality point is absolutely critical as well. Um, uh, definitely. But I think we're um, I, I'd like to think that we're we're kind of um, in a position to take on on, on board the, the fact that there are groups that experience inequality and um, oppression right across society that are not um uh it, it, there's 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 there are, there are not just certain groups which are going to be favored over over others I, I think it's something that we would consider across the board and it's interesting um i mean i guess again with the kind of just with the leads perspective again very specific i mean um i don't think damien mentioned it but but another thing that i mean we we have had a big investment in leads through the lot through the National Lottery Community Funds Women and Girls Initiative, which was a, a, a national strategic program, and 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 that's that's helped to establish the Women's Lives Leads Partnership, which, um, it, you know, we have invested quite a large sum of money in that over over the last few years, and and uh, one of the things that uh, Damien's um, uh, partnership has been really keen to do and has been doing is 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 working with that women's partnership and 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 making those really strong links there as well so that's been a really um a really positive aspect and um uh i think it's you know we're at the, at the moment we're, we're not i'm not i don't think we're in a, we're in a position we're going to have a similar program for, for men and boys but then the women and girls initiative was part of a series of strategic programs many of which are coming to an end now that was a particular uh, uh, set of programs but but um no no i i, I yeah in, in summary i would like i would i would suggest that we are as a funder i think more, more um we, we we accept a much more nuanced approach to equity diversity and inclusion than simply you know saying there are certain groups we want to fund and others are, are less of a priority i think i think the key thing that just the reference I made in the presentation was really around ensuring that whatever it is that whatever group wants to do that they are inclusive in the sense that they've thought about so if it's if it's a project that's targeting men have they thought about disabled uh you know men with disabilities how they're going to be able to access the project is they going to it, it, it gay bisexual transgender men are they going to be included how how what what proactive steps are you going to take to make sure make sure that 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 uh, men 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 <coughs> with those protected characteristics are going to be able to um, participate and benefit from the project that's fantastic i think on the, i think that is the end the note to end it on to be honest with you i mean i think that is absolutely the point to wrap it up and yeah really, can, can uh, i can i can say, say thank you dan for that um i'll i'll abuse my privilege of chair and, and just <laughs> shouting over the top of you uh, and to say uh, first of all stephen um, I hope it was kind of self-evident that the fact that you're here talking to us, to us, and we're like having a, uh, and we're delighted to host you here today, is okay. really just the fact that uh, the National Lottery and the staff there understand this and are really good at this, and, and we really appreciate it. And please don't think that anything I said was intended to have a go at the the lottery no, or no. anyone else. No, absolutely, uh, but also. No. In having these conversations, I, I, I really appreciate that you have got a quite nuanced and, and 
uh, informed understanding of the issues that we're, we're dealing and a lot of other funders will have to, uh, but what we're hoping to do in this in this process is just kind of push that nuance on and make sure that, yeah, we are always interested in having this conversation at a better level. And we're also aware that, you know, that our real concern is that decisions can go at the margin, you know, where, where there's a 50-50 a call, does, does this funder fund this project or that project? Um, they will lean back on a lazy assumption that a project that's funding men is delivering less DEI value than a project that's funding women. Um, and we would urge you to maybe, you know, as, as a sector, I don't mean you personally, uh, but we would urge you as a sector to maybe think with a bit more nuance about those issues. And that's why we're here today. So thank you again. It's a pleasure, Ali. Th th thanks for inviting me. I mean, did you have one? Did you? Oh, I'm just thanking everyone and wishing them out, wishing you all a happy Friday and a nice weekend. Yes, so, yes indeed. Thanks for arranging, well, Dan and everyone. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Lovely series ever to Owen. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you so much, Damien. Uh, there will be a recording. It will be shared. Um, probably not immediately, but it will be shared. Um, but um, have a lovely Friday afternoon and a great weekend. Take care of yourselves. Thanks, everybody. Bye.